Trouble in Madagascar by Edward Bristol. Copyright 2013, Edward Bristol. Production copyright 2013 by Edward Bristol. Narrated by Tim Paulson. Produced at Raven Audiobooks. Chapter 1. Toliara, West Coast of Madagascar, 2001. Waves splashed gently. Green sunbirds played in the palms, and all was peaceful. Until... I looked around. At this hour, the beach was mostly empty. Nightlife is a serious business in Madagascar, and few tourists crawl from their rooms before noon. Two meters to my left, half covered by the sand, rang a black mobile phone. I picked it up and wiped it clean. Just before I could answer, the ringing stopped. It was a new but simple Nokia, its battery half full, roaming on a local provider. No messages. No contacts, only a long list of unanswered no-ID calls. Some tourist must have lost it in the heat of the night, probably drunk and rolling in the sand. I dropped the phone in my pocket and decided to go for breakfast. It was my day off. Gem trade goes on seven days a week, but I found it healthy to cut one day for spiritual recovery, or laziness, or just because all religions say so. For breakfast, I ordered a fresh mango pancake. Now the sound came from my jacket. I forked a piece of pancake. I hoped the caller would hang up before I finished chewing. A mother with brawling twin toddlers frowned at me from across the empty room. Embarrassed, I pulled the mobile from my jacket. Unknown caller ID. I pressed the green button. Hello? Richard? Hello? A deep male voice in a French dialect. No, not Richard. My name is Edward. I swallowed the remaining pancake and drew breath to add Bristol, but was rudely interrupted. You speak French? Yes, but my English is better, I said. My French was okay, but on the phone I preferred English, especially since the local gibberish could hardly be called French. I want to speak to Richard. The man sounded angry. And fat. If this was Richard's father-in-law, I didn't want to be in his shoes. I smiled with a bit of schadenfreude and said, This is not my phone. Yes, we know that, he growled. The Nokia seemed to vibrate in my hand. Where is Richard? My smile died. I already told you, I don't know. The fat fellow was getting on my nerves. Look, I'm just trying to help. I suggest... We meet? He interrupted again. Yes, yes. Can you come? Sure. Where? When? Well, now I'm having breakfast, I said. Where? In the Blue Paradise. Hotel? Yes, in the hotel. I'll go to the lobby after breakfast. Call me later, okay? I will be in lobby. Sixty minutes. He hung up. Very impolite, this fat fellow. Only the language barrier, I hoped, but wondered why he was measuring time in minutes when everybody else on Madagascar seemed to measure time in hours or days. After another coffee and one more pancake, I gave the waiter my room number and a thousand arrieri. The Blue Paradise was a big sprawl of cabanas, each standing on stilts and fenced in to keep out animals. I had planned to go to the lobby anyway and thought a stroll would do good to settle the pancakes. On my days off, I usually stay inside the hotel premises. As a gemstone buyer, I get ample local flavor during my work. I was looking forward to a poolside day, a book, a massage, several civilized meals with naps in between, and nobody pestering me for money. A perfect day. When I arrived at the lobby, I found nobody, no concierge, no manager, 
No fat fellow waiting. Somebody ought to have been there. After all, the blue paradise bragged with four stars. I went into the souvenir shop. It was equally abandoned. Where was everybody? I'm no shoplifter, but how could they leave their stuff alone? In a glass cabinet, I saw local gemstone jewelry and stepped closer. Ah, I thought, searching my pockets while looking at the jewelry. Sensing a movement close behind, I turned around and found myself at eye level with a golden Armani tie clip. I leaned back to look up. The man connected to the phone in my hand was not fat, but giant. At over two meters, six foot eight, I estimated him to lift three hundred pounds and immediately felt dwarfed. Mr. Three Hundred Pounds wore a dark suit and white shirt. Very out of place here in this flip-flop, beer-at-noon beach resort. Two more shadows loomed to his left and right. I would have loved to step back, but that would have taken me into the jewelry cabinet. So I stood my little ground and tried to smile. His pox-scarred moon face glared down at me with an intense grimace of multiple toothaches. Where is Richard? he cried, his bass oscillating in my mustache. Spittle flew over my head. Remember, it was early morning. I was not ready for clever or for being yelled at. I must have stammered something unintelligible. He grabbed me by the throat and, although I'm not puny at 160 pounds, lifted me off the ground. Where is Richard? The man smelled of stomach acid and the bitter local brew the islanders called coffee. I cringed and kicked air. The shadows from behind closed in. They looked no more comforting than the guy from whose arm I was dangling. I really don't know. That was as far as I got. Three hundred pounds had the punch of a train. It would have stopped an elephant. Luckily, he didn't bother to make a fist. He hit me with his palm flat on the forehead like one would slam his own head when forgetting something. His palm reminded me of the pancake I had just eaten. Same size, same color. Little white stars flashed inside my skull and zoomed out as I flew backwards into the jewelry display. I vaguely remember being dragged and a stinking wet cloth being pressed on my nose and mouth. Then all went black. I awoke to the scent of icy air conditioning. Lying on my side, mostly naked, I found my hands stuck behind my back and my legs tied together. Something was bound over my eyes and I was gagged with some nasty rag. I shivered with my skin all goosed up in the cold. Forget about it, I told myself. Sleep some more. Wake up later. Go to the beach and have a nice breakfast. It's your day off but it was too cold for sleeping. I needed to turn down the A.C. or I would get seriously sick. I rolled onto my belly and aroused attention. Somebody kicked me in the ribs. Not too hard, more an acknowledgement of presence than a blow. A door opened and a man called out. I could not catch the words. It was one of those Malagasy dialects that only a particular tribe understands. From the open door, a beautifully warm puff of air caressed my body. No central A.C., I thought. There must be a single cooling unit in the room. I listened. Yes, I could hear it rattling off to the left, one of those old machines that sound like a landing jet, yet needed to be switched off, urgently. Heavy steps came up the stairs. The door closed, cutting off the warm breeze. Somebody pulled the rag from my mouth. I slurped air like a fish on land, wanting to protest but lacking saliva, only croaked. Several men laughed. A deep growl silenced them. I recognized that bass. It was three hundred pounds. Where is Richard? Oh, man. Where is he? Who? What do you want from me? Me sounded like Tom Waits after two nights out, only worse. Somebody ripped off the blindfold. I blinked at purple linoleum imprinted with yellow daisies. Big hands grabbed my shoulder and rolled me on my back. 
three hundred pounds was squatting next to me. I will mash your face if you don't tell. He made a crushing gesture in front of my head and then sat on a chair. I looked around. The room was bare except for a bed without mattress and a few chairs. Four men stood under a light bulb dangling from a naked wire. Who do you work for? Three hundred pounds asked. MLF? I am a mistake, I stammered. My name is Edward Bristol. I am... We know who you are. That surprised me. You do? Yes, but we want to know where Richard is. I don't know Richard. Why do you have his phone? I found it on the beach. Three hundred pounds leaned back and scowled. You found the phone? I did. I thought somebody lost it. In a moment of silence, three hundred pounds looked at his men. They stared back, dumb. On the beach? Yes, in the morning. You are not authorized to negotiate? He asked. Negotiate what? Despite my ridiculous situation, anger choked my throat. You are a gem trader, right? He asked. Yes. So what? But you don't know Richard? No. Three hundred pounds looked at his watch, sighed, and got up. Too late today, he said to his fellows. I don't believe this nonsense. He looked at me. You take your time and think very hard. If you lie, I will mash your face tomorrow. He turned to the door. Hey, I screamed. Switch the A.C. off. I'll die in this cold. Three hundred pounds turned and wagged his index finger at me. Bazaars are supposed to like cold climates, he said. Laughing, they filed out of the room. We don't sleep naked on the floor, I yelled. Turn it off! The door closed. Snap and lock. The men's voices trailed downstairs. I flew into a rage pulling at the coarse but strong tape, hurting my ankles and wrists, screaming in fury and despair until, finally, I cried like in the days when my father had whacked me without even bothering to invent a reason. The tears formed icicles on my cheeks. I stopped crying and followed the last advice three hundred pounds had given. I thought very hard before my brain could freeze. Did I know any Richard? No. Could I make any sense of this? No. Would anybody miss me? No. At least, not for some time. This was before gym traders were expected to check their emails every twelve hours or risk a complaint on Pricescope.com. If I didn't show up, my local business partners would shrug and search for a buyer elsewhere. My girlfriend at the time, a hard-boiled ballet dancer in St. Petersburg, was obsessed only with her career. Weeks could pass before she or my far-flung family would worry enough to call an embassy. I was alone. Thinking would not stop the cold. Inching around, I caught sight of an old Hitachi AC roaring under a shuttered window. I rolled and wiggled toward it, like a squashed beetle, ever so slowly, until I lay panting right under the frigging cold blast. The off switch glowed in red plastic perhaps one meter off the ground. The machine rattled and shook in its frame. I tried to bring my legs up, cutting myself on the loose screws, but could not hit the red button. One meter can be amazingly far. Just when I considered kicking the whole AC through the wall, I again heard footsteps. The door unlocked and opened. In came three hundred pounds and a guy with a mattress. We don't want you dead yet, huh? three hundred pounds said and issued something akin to a smile. He stepped over me and punched the red button. The A.C. died. The warm breeze from the open door and the subsiding noise was a heavenly pleasure. The other guy threw the mattress on the bed, pulled a knife, and cut the tape from my legs and then from my wrists. I groaned and tried to get up but remained frozen to the purple linoleum and its yellow daisies. Three hundred pounds stood in silence arms barely crossed over his tanker chest. 
his lips delicately pursed in deep thought as he stared at my naked feet. I whispered, You have the wrong. It's not me. He smacked his lips, frowned, and said, We'll see tomorrow. They left. Untied and defrosting, I was too thankful to complain. I dragged myself onto the bed and lay still, enjoying the wonderful warmth flooding my body. The heat of an African night had never been more welcome. Too hot? Impossible. Yet, after a while, I got very thirsty. I considered banging on the door but didn't dare to stress my host with new demands. I swallowed dry and got up. Through the slits of the shuttered window I saw nothing but black savanna. No lights. We were in the wilderness, at night. The window was bolted, the knob missing, and a thick padlock hung on the shutters. I checked the room for anything useful. Nothing but a copper coin under the bed. Assets at hand, boxer shorts, and one coin. I listened. Somebody was watching a war movie at full volume. I switched off the light, lay in bed, and listened to the machine gun fire intercepted by shouts and explosions. Somewhere mid-movie, I put the coin between my lips and slowly crawled over to the A.C. The Hitachi was not only ancient, but also badly installed, a lousy piece of handiwork. No moon lit my way that night, but more stars shone than a city soul can imagine the Milky Way in its equatorial glory. Running barefoot through African bush is an awful idea, unless you have, like I did, 300 good reasons. Thorns, rocks, and shells cut into my civilized butter feet. Though Madagascar has no apex predators other than humans, I expected to be eaten at any moment. Perhaps some giant fossas had survived human colonization and were now waiting in the bushes to take revenge on the hated two legs. At night, wilderness gets to your heart. No fossas showed up. In the distance, up a slope, a small yellow light flickered. Local herders or farmers, I hoped, not armed thugs or friends of three hundred pounds. After a while, I made out a hut with a fireplace. A man huddled there, lazily stoking the fire. No car. A good sign, I thought. Thugs have cars. Maneo! Help! Friend! I tried French, English, and Malagasy. The man jumped away from the fire and into the dark. I raised my hands. It was still a long way to limp. Dogs bolted from the hut, barking furiously as I slowly moved on. Smaller shadows and another adult rushed from the little hut. A family. I was so relieved. Hesitantly, the man came closer, shushed the dogs, and stared me in the face. Vazaha! he called back to his family. The kids squeaked with excitement and wonder. The man looked around and then asked in French, What are you doing here? I am lost. I am thirsty. Come, come. He was a sakalava with a tall, slender, and narrow face. I limped toward the fire. The kids hid behind their mother, peeking past her skirt. When I stepped into the light, the kids began to cry. They know Vizaha is only in mint condition, from shampoo ads and tourist buses. Probably I was their first white man so close up. We are a shocking sight for those kids. Pale ghosts with shining eyes. Scary even without the blood and dirt that had accumulated on my naked body. The mother, her face covered with the traditional orange mud mask, swayed backwards, nearly falling over her kids. She said something in Malagasy. Don't be afraid. I'm a good man, I said. Their father motioned to his family and they hustled off. My name is Haja, he said to me. Haja sat down at the fire and invited me to join. Unable to squat like he did, I sat sideways, leaving my bloody feet outside the fire's protective ring. Immediately, giant warrior ants started to explore my feet. I knew fighting them was useless. They would carry off the loose skin and dried blood, 
As long as I was at least half alive, they would not try to cut fresh pieces. Haja's family came back with several pots. I thought about infections. If I ever made it to a pharmacy, I promised myself a double dose of broad-spectrum antibiotics to raise my life expectancy beyond fifty. The woman directed her eldest daughter to wash my feet. I protested, but the mother silenced me with a wave of her hand. The water hurt badly. The kids stood in a circle, whispering and giggling. I clenched my teeth and braved it out, but then two ants must have felt threatened by the rag and bit me simultaneously. I howled. The daughter picked the ants off and threw them in the fire, where they crackled in small explosions. My host stared into the flames, contemplating, waiting. What happened to you? he asked after a while. I was taken by a genet. I escaped. He pondered those words for a while. His wife squatted next to us and offered tea and dried meat. This genet, does he look for you? Haja asked. I understood he was worried about his family. Yes, in the morning he will be looking for me. Where is the genet? I ran half the night from that direction. I pointed to the northeast. It was a big house on a cliff. The man exchanged a troubled look with his wife, and they spoke in Malagasy. I waited for the verdict. That is a bad genet. He looked away to the dark horizon and said, You need to leave before morning. I nodded. At least I could stay the night. Haja killed the fire. Better we are not seen, he said. I was fed, watered, and issued a thin cloak. The ants kept me awake for the rest of the night. When the sun flashed over the hills, I was already limping along nicely. With my feet bound in rags, my head shielded under an old leather hat, a faded, torn blue shirt over my boxer shorts, and a bamboo staff in hand, I felt well equipped. I had tried to pledge to bring back the hat, but Haja made me promise that I would not come back at all. He had politely deflected all my questions about the house on the cliff. Either he didn't know much, or he was too scared. The only information that I could gather was that the house belonged to the government. Under the circumstances, I considered this bad news. Jumping from the first floor into the dark and running for my life, I had not stopped to read the sign on the door, though I doubted there was one. I had looked back in fear, not scrutiny, but I clearly remembered a western-style manner. There wouldn't be many of those type in the hills, far away from the sandy beaches of the west coast and room 1212 at the Blue Paradise. If 300 pounds was indeed government, legal or not, never mind the details in Africa, I was bugshit. Worse, I was bugshit on an island, hard to get away without money and a passport. The scrubby landscape steadily ascended toward the west into the central mountain ranges of Madagascar. Solitary baobab trees stood like connections between earth and sky. Haja had told me to go west. Along the foot of the mountains I saw lonely trucks and cars raising dust clouds from an unpaved road. There, Haja had promised, I could catch a bus to the next village. I discovered that Haja's water bottle had a leak. I finished the leftovers in one gulp and plodded on through the blistering sun. Whenever I felt tired, I imagined three hundred pounds finding the A.C. screwed off the wall. The thought propelled me on. Later, I climbed into a creek in search of water. It was dry, but my eyes caught what I originally had come for. Colored pebbles. I picked up a walnut-sized blue crystal, spit on it, rubbed it clean, and held it up against the sun. It was beautifully transparent and cornflower blue. The creek was dotted with them, as well as yellows and pinks, a rare alluvial deposit, so sweet but not very helpful at the time. I collected a dozen gems in Haja's bottle and noted the location. Three baobab trees formed an oasis to the south, and a jagged hill like barracuda teeth lay about ten miles to the west. At noon, I reached a dusty stretch of gravel, cutting endlessly straight through the highlands. I hid behind a bush and waited. Soon after, 
A convoy of undesignated black land cruisers barreled north. I stayed very put behind my bush. The next vehicle was a single-cab Hilux. I dared not come out, though I was getting really thirsty. Finally, a red and yellow bus appeared. Public transport. Just what I needed. The bus snaked down the dusty road, cruising around potholes, stopping here and there to pick up or let down people who then vanished into the bushes. I hid the bottle with gems under my shirt and waited. The windows and doors of the bus had long been removed. A huge diesel cloud followed behind. At the last moment, I jumped out of hiding and ran onto the road, flailing my arms and yelling. The monster crashed to a halt in a storm of dust and screaming metal. Heads pushed through the empty window frames. Shouts and laughter ensued. A totally ragged Vizaha, all alone, in the middle of the road. The driver beckoned me to step on board. Only then did I note the flaw in my plan. I had no money for the bus ticket, not even the coin that I had used as a screwdriver. I stepped onto the bus, ready to throw myself at the driver's mercy and plead for a free ride, when the man hissed, One hundred thousand. A full-scale dinner at the Blue Paradise was one hundred thousand, perhaps fifty U.S. dollars at the time, but it was also a week's salary in Madagascar, if you were lucky enough to have a job. I rarely used public transport in Africa, but it sure wasn't one hundred thousand ariari. One hundred? I asked honestly irritated. Ayo, one hundred, he declared with an expression suggesting that I might also walk if I wished. Dozens of faces in various colors stared over rusty metal seats. Everybody was delighted with the unexpected entertainment on such a boring bus ride. That is Coco, I said. I would have given him a million if I had it. However, the man was a public servant doing his job, not a private businessman. Public transport was not subject to negotiation, not even in Africa. He stretched out his meaty hand and gave me a crooked grimace. One hundred, he said, lowering his voice. You are ashamed of your country, I said, raising my voice. He snarled and motioned me to get off his bus. I did not move but kept up the volume. Because I am a foreigner, you want to charge a hundred thousand instead of... I looked around for help. In the front sat a man with long gray hair and thick staff. I asked him directly, How much is fair to the next stop? Five hundred arieri, said the old man with a strong voice and nodded encouragingly. Five hundred, instead of one hundred thousand. I called into the bus and turned back on the driver. You want to charge me two hundred times more than the others? A murmur rippled through our spectators. Those Vazahas are faster than pocket calculators. The driver shifted in his seat and cast a gloomy eye at the old man. So, when you come to my country, we can charge you more because of your skin color? I asked. At this, the old man shook his head, knocked on the floor with a staff and cried, No, even five hundred is too much. You are a thief, that's what you are. Several people threw in Malagasy comments and passionate chatter ensued. Leave the Vazaha in peace, the old man said. The driver shook his head in disgust and motioned me to pass through. I thanked him, waved at some kids and sat down, politely smiling this way and that. The bus jolted on. Everybody had a good time discussing the evil driver, my torn feet and the old hat. The miracle of the ragged Vazaha would provide fodder for many evening tales and wild conspiracies. Somebody tapped my shoulder and I jerked up from my pleasant dream. It was the old man, smiling. The bus rattled to a halt in a small market. The driver killed the engine. Everybody got up. I had no inkling where, why, or what I was, except hungry and in pain. The market looked like any in Africa. Low buildings, no signs, one road, one petrol shed, and zero Vazahas. I needed cash, my passport, my phone and credit cards, and an airport. Urgently.
Chapter 2 A Small Market in the Highlands of Madagascar Dazed and weak, I stepped off the bus. Kids shouted and people rushed closer to see the shredded Vizaha. Within seconds, I was surrounded by a crowd of curious onlookers. If 300 pounds or his men were around, I would be as visible as a lighthouse by night. I ducked into an eatery. A throng of people tried to follow but were pushed back by a small Asian man sporting a plastic apron. Having expelled the crowd, he, the eatery's owner, I assumed, proudly guided me through a cloud of flies to one of his three tables. He sort of cleaned the table, bowed, and invited me to sit. As I sank on the red metal chair, Haja's empty water bottle with the rough gemstones I had found in the dry creek slipped from my boxer shorts and rolled over the floor. The gems rattled merrily. Everybody looked. My host's face lit up in comprehension. Then he stood stiff, waiting for my order. I hastily picked up the bottle and hid it between my legs. I need help, I said. He frowned. Help? What help? I need a car. He shushed some kids giggling through the empty window frames. You need transport? Yes. Where? How much? He asked. To Teleria. One hundred thousand. He thought for a moment and then nodded enthusiastically. I have a cousin with a motorbike. Please, get him. And I need a woman's dress. Uh, a burqa or something that covers my face. He stared at my rags on my body, knitting his eyebrows. One hundred and fifty thousand? I offered. He relaxed and nodded. I hoped my cash in the hotel was still alive. Before the man turned, I pulled him close. No talk. Be quick, I urged. He pulled off his apron while shouting commands at his family standing in the back of the room. His wife served me coffee and fried bananas while his son cleared the windows and doors from spectators. I ate and drank as if I could pay until a young man with dreadlocks and a Santa Claus t-shirt stepped to my table. I'm the cousin. He gave me two thumbs up. Sit, I said. We wait for my dress. The cousin told me of his local reggae band and asked, Can you get me a label in England? Sorry, I'm not in the music business, I said. You're in the gym trade, right? He pointed to the bottle between my legs. Where'd you find those? I did not answer. Is that why you're hiding? He pushed on. No. So what's the problem? I feared he might refuse to give me a ride or even sell me to 300 pounds. Before I could spin a wild story about a jealous girlfriend, the owner of the eatery returned. He put a black bundle on the table and smiled triumphantly. I need a place to change and then get on the bike without everybody looking, I said and got up. The owner led me out the back and into his bedroom. Alone, I poured the rough gemstones from the bottle into a plastic bag and tied it to my boxer shorts. Then I pulled the black dress over my head. It was a niqab, a huge and smelly one. On a cabinet stood a small mirror. Except for the blue eyes behind the slit, I was good for an anonymous bike ride. Kids giggled through a crack in the wall. The cousin picked me up on a dirt track behind the house and we thundered out of the village. Because of the dress, I had to sit sideways. I clenched one arm around the cousin, and with the other hand I prevented my garment from catching in the chains. I wished I hadn't told the cousin to hurry, but he probably always drove ambulance style. Everybody did. There seemed to be only one traffic rule. You must drive as fast as possible. Beyond the laws of physics, we sped through herds of cows and children, zigzagged round potholes overtook cars on the shoulder and squeezed between oncoming trucks. All the while, the cousin spoke on his phone, heckled girls, and greeted friends. I closed my eyes and reflected on why I was risking my life under a smelly niqab. I had answered a stranger's phone. My mistake. I should have been more careful. Never give a stranger your location. I just hadn't seen this coming. I had felt safe in the blue paradise. But who could evacuate the lobby of a four-star hotel in sixty minutes and abduct an innocent guest? Even in Africa, that was not an easy feat. Police? Government agencies? Perhaps organized crime could do it. But why? Was this some scam? 
Had 300 pounds planted that Nakia on me? No, I didn't think so. True, I did come to that bench every morning, but dropping a phone into the sand was hardly a reliable trick to lure somebody in. 300 pounds could have walked straight up to my bench and hit me on the head. I didn't think he would have had a problem with that type of process. He had known my name, though. He must have gotten my details from the hotel. No, this was not a scam or a plain kidnapping. 300 pounds had actually thought I wanted to negotiate something. What could I have been negotiating? Suddenly, the cousin slowed to a normal speed. Police! A checkpoint! He hissed. There was a surprise in his voice. And fear. I peeked over his shoulder. Two battered police cars blocked the road ahead. On the side stood one of those black land cruisers I had seen before. My stomach cramped. What do they check? I asked. He shrugged. Can we turn around? Too late, he said. I'm sick. I sleep. I buried my face in his dreadlocks and pumped all the air from my lungs. I've seen locals sleep like that on the back of motorbikes. The cousin put down his feet and we stopped. Somebody called in Malagasy. My heart pounded, but I hardly breathed. The cousin greeted back. Questions and answers were exchanged. It sounded civil and polite. Through the pock pock of the motor, I caught the word Rene, mother. Nobody forced my face into the open. Then the cousin accelerated again. I did not budge until we cleared the next bent. What did they ask for? I yelled into the wind. You! he shouted back without hesitation. I chewed on that for the rest of the journey. At the edge of Talaria, I motioned him to finally slow the fuck down. As we passed the Blue Paradise's driveway, I craned my neck, but could not see anything suspicious. I directed the cousin to the beach next to the hotel. The beach bars already enjoyed lively noon business. Men drank cold beers with last night's hookers. Muslim mamas can't access beach resorts, so I asked the cousin to go alone and carefully inquire about Mr. Bristol in room 1212. Tell them, Mr. Bristol booked a fishing trip and see their reaction. Don't talk, just go and come, I said and hoped it wouldn't be go and run. I pulled the headscarf deep over my eyes, stared at the ground and waited. Nobody takes note of a Muslim mama. It felt great to be invisible, but I got very hot under the black synthetics. The sweat itched. I waited and sweated and waited. Approximately seventeen days later, the cousin, off his bike as slow as Buddha on Valium, returned with a blank face, started the engine without a word, and motioned me to get on. I sat quiet as we dashed out of Talaria. Soon after, the cousin diverted into a small track and stopped in an abandoned hut. We got off the bike. The cousin sat on a rock and pulled a crooked cigarette from his shirt. When he lit the cigarette, I smelled it was ganja, not tobacco. Mr. Bristol is gone, he said, after a deep drag and offered me the joint. I declined. Gone? How? I asked. Like in disappeared or like in checked out? After some consideration, he decided, checked out, he said. The bill was paid, the luggage is gone, Bristol is gone, he added. I moaned and held my head. Three hundred pounds must be government. Only then could he kidnap a guest and make the hotel say he checked out. As the implication settled, I swayed and dropped on the floor next to the cousin. What now? he asked. My friend C.T. was Indonesian. Three hairs grew from a wart on his chin down to his chest, supposedly a sign of good luck. However, the charm hadn't worked back in Jakarta when his gambling buddies had chopped off both pinky fingers in exchange for an unpaid debt. Leaving his pinkies and his family behind, C.T. had escaped to this African island and now lived in relatively grand style from various, more or less legal, enterprises. We had done some gem deals together. Fortunately, I remembered the way to his private residence. It was getting dark when we arrived at C.T.'s gate. I pulled the nakeb from my face and the surprised servant ran to get his master. 
Soon after, C.T. came across the yard. When he recognized me, he ordered the gate to be opened. He was a good Muslim and would never refuse hospitality. C.T. paid the cousin the promised 150000 The cousin pulled a card from his trousers and gave it to me. If you ever need a reggae band, call me, he said. I thanked him and waved goodbye. C.T. and his servant helped me to one of the guest rooms, and only then did I register the growing pain in my cut feet. I asked the servant for a bottle of whiskey. It would be my first drink in years, but I couldn't care less at the moment. Moaning and groaning, I peeled the bloody rags off my feet and downed two more shots before I got into the shower. The hot water felt as if I had stepped into an active volcano. When I finally limped from my guest room, I was clean, but no longer sober. Three drinks slam hard after all that time. C.T. was waiting for me in one of his five sofa sets. It was dark now, and I could smell dinner being prepared in the kitchen. We had another drink while I briefly described my last twenty-four hours. Huge black fellow with pockmark moon face and bodyguards, he asked after I had finished. Giant monster, I affirmed. My host picked up his phone, dialed, and walked out. After a while, he came back and said, There's a problem. Ah, really? Irritated, I groaned and pulled my hair. C.T. frowned at my uncivilized display of negative emotions. Sorry, I said, and held up the whiskey for explanation. What did you hear? It's a bit fuzzy. Something about a huge mining deal with too many fingers in the cake. Do you know anything about this deal? No, I'm not into doing big deals. You know I'm a humble gem trader. They had the wrong guy, I said. He nodded thoughtfully and played with the ice in his glass. And you don't know that, Richard? No idea. He stared at me, doubt in his eyes. I held his gaze. My friend, I swear on my mother's honor that I have not a splinter of an idea what those people wanted from me. He poured us another drink and gave me a long look. A mother's honor was a big oath to make. It doesn't matter, really, he said with a sigh. The problem is that you are in the gem trade. If you had been a plain tourist, they might have considered a mistake. But you... Who is they? I interrupted. What do you know? He did not answer my question, but said, Running away has made it more difficult. Should I have waited for the morning torture? C.T. sighed and shook his head. You know who that fat fellow is, I said. Is he government? Tell me. C.T. leaned back, tenderly stroking his three facial hairs. Let's think this over and find out what's going on before we get hasty, he said, finally. I asked him to send for some Cipro and a Mox. Ten times five hundred milligram each would kill all that was alive in me, including my intestinal flora, but that couldn't be helped. I also ordered a bottle of Vicodin and Xanax. You are safe here. Let's see tomorrow, C.T. said during dinner. My pills arrived and I went to bed. I beamed myself into chemo sleep and awoke at dawn, literally in pain from head to toe. I groped for the Vicodin, popped two and fell asleep again. When I came from my room, it was noon already. C.T. had gone out. His servant made me a late breakfast and then I waited. A doctor came and examined my feet, disinfected and bound them. Too late for stitches, he said. One would not believe how painful feet can be. I popped more Vicodin until late afternoon. By then, my whole body felt numb. I went out on the veranda and asked for a tea. The tea had just arrived when C.T.'s white Camry came up the driveway. Behind drove two black land cruisers. I put down my tea. The Camry stopped and C.T. got out on my side. The car swayed and three hundred pounds heaved out on the other side. For an instant, I considered running, but I was tired of it and it seemed useless, especially with my injured feet. C.T. smiled with excitement. I stood as he came up the stairs. The two land cruisers spilled a small army of fierce black suits. One of them I remembered from the house on the cliff. I kept quiet and watched three hundred pounds coming around the car. He did not look like he was going to jump me right away, but more businesslike. 
He moved up the stairs with a boxer's sway. As he closed in, I felt the urge to duck under the table, but bravely restrained myself. C.T. stood next to me and, with the air of a statesman, said, Edward, allow me to introduce Francis Rectilar, Chief of Secret Police and Internal Audit of the Malagasy Republic. Three hundred pounds smiled and stretched out his pancake hand. Excuse my jab yesterday, he said. Okay, was all I could think of to say. Let's go inside and talk, said C.T., and we followed him to his rose-colored VIP sofa. C.T. made a conciliatory gesture and had us seated. Three hundred pounds filled one double-seater by himself. The sofa squeaked as he sat. We have a common problem to solve. C.T. nodded at three hundred pounds, who nodded at me, all friendly. I tried to return his smile, but could not. Chief of Secret Police of Madagascar? Thank you. The servant brought fresh tea. Allow me to explain, C.T. said. Francis is looking for a Vazaha who was abducted in Tana a few days ago. I wanted to ask, so? But C.T. gave me a look to be quiet. The person kidnapped was Richard, a Brit. His phone was used by the kidnappers to negotiate. Francis traced the phone down here. Then the kidnappers went silent, and the next day it was you he had on the line. Hence the confusion. Confusion was a nice choice of words. I remembered how I crashed into the jewelry cabinet and pulled the bottle of Vicodin from my pocket. Three hundred pounds watched me attentively. So, now that we know it was only, uh, confusion, I said, shaking a pill into my hand and then looking at three hundred pounds, you'll give me my stuff from my hotel and I'm free to go? Three hundred pounds just sat there, staring. Not so fast, C.T. said. As I said, we have a problem to solve. Richard was working on a deal for the government. Gem mining concessions for the south of the island. We all know what's in the south, right? I nodded and sipped my tea. Madagascar had turned out to be as rich in gems as Sri Lanka before Europeans plundered it. Until recently, nobody had bothered to look, but now the word had spread. Sleepy villages in the south had gone berserk with money and a population that doubled by the hour. High-quality gems poured from thousands of small mines. If managed well, this could be the end to poverty on Madagascar. The contract Richard worked on is rather important. The amount under negotiation is 500 billion ariari. I feigned interest. 500 million, huh? Nice deal. C.T. laughed and leaned back. No, the word starts with a B as in blue. I made sure I didn't misunderstand. The number is 500 billion. I was used to Malagasy ariaris coming in big numbers but I needed some time to count the zeros there. The last gem I bought had cost 10 million ariari. That was 5,000 U.S. dollars or several years of hard labor, enough to buy a house in Madagascar. 500 billion? But that's 200 million U.S. dollars. Yes, that's quite a deal, isn't it? C.T. said with a broad smile. I looked from C.T. to 300 pounds and back. This was serious. Dangerous. Honor and friendship ceased to matter in Africa or elsewhere when the numbers were big enough for a new life in Paris. With me speechless, C.T. continued his briefing. The contract was going to be signed this week, in five days. Everybody was happy. Then Richard vanished. Francis was ordered to find him quickly. Finally, I got out the main question that burned my brain. What does this have to do with me? Three hundred pounds leaned forward and looked me in the eyes. You finish the contract. What? Get the contract signed, and then you can go home, he said. I sat dumbfounded for a while. Who's the contract with? I asked, finally, just to say something. C.T. opened his mouth, but three hundred pounds waved him off. President Mahefa Andriarani was approached by one ore, a British mining company. 
Adriarani hired Richard to negotiate. Now Richard is gone. We cannot tell one or our project manager has been kidnapped. They might change their mind at the last minute. We need to close the deal, quietly, without drama. You want me to negotiate a mining deal for President Adriarani? I laughed. This was hilarious. Yes, 300 pounds said without flinching. If the contract is not signed in five days, there will be no money. If there is no money, the president will be very angry. C.T. nodded, fatherly style, and chimed in, That'll be a big problem. Not my problem, I wanted to say, but 300 pounds was faster. I have your passport, he said with a matter-of-fact smile and added, You are the only suspect in Richard's kidnapping. I jumped up. You betrayed me, I yelled at C.T. C.T. shook his head sadly and motioned me to sit. Look, the one or team is coming. Somebody needs to reel them in. It'll all be over in a few days. I sat down again. C.T. put his hand on my shoulder, but I shook him off. Three hundred pounds watched us with an amused expression. Get a lawyer, or somebody else. I know nothing about it, I said. But you're perfect. You're here. You know the gym business. You're European Vizaha like Richard. You can do it, said C.T. This was your idea, I said, and pointed my finger at C.T. Yes, C.T. admitted with a contented smile, but consider the alternatives. He looked over to 300 pounds, and they nodded at each other. My friend had rented me to 300 pounds. If they had promised C.T. only one base point of 200 million, it was very good business. See it as a side gig, C.T. said. Just a job. I need no job. Less of all with the secret police. Three hundred pounds shifted and the sofa squeaked in pain. C.T. frowned and they exchanged some words in Malagasy. I interrupted their tete-a-tete. One or is what? The number two or three mining company in the world? They're not stupid. Don't you think they'll notice it's not the same guy they talk to? No problem, C.T. said. They spoke only on the phone. They never met in person. Three hundred pounds leaned in and added, Richard has an assistant in Tana. She'll help you. We have everything we need except Richard. Tana is short for Antananarivo, the capital of Madagascar. Four thousand feet above sea level, it's either rainy or chilly. Most tourists only see the airport of Tana, for good reason. Tana, Antananarivo, Madagascar. Next morning, on a 12-seat, two-prop government plane from Talario to Tana, 300 pounds dumped a kilo of paper on my lap. This is the contract, as good as finished, he said. I started to read, but then the plane came into turbulence. I did not get motion sickness easily. Hence, I did not see it coming until it was too late. There was no emergency bag in my seat only the contract in my hand. Legal paper does not soak up fluid very well. Three hundred pounds studied my pale face while the steward deposed the dripping contract into a garbage bin and sprayed the cockpit with deodorant. No problem, only a copy, said three hundred pounds. In Tana, I was escorted to a master suite in the Hilton, one bedroom plus sitting room with a desk, fax, PC, sofa set, and a bodyguard. Our permanent suite, 300 pounds said. All yours, he added. The permanent suite of the secret police in Madagascar surely was as private as public radio in North Korea, I thought, but kept my mouth shut. One of the black suits carried in my belongings from the Blue Paradise. Somebody had neatly packed my luggage. I checked for my money and my gems. All was intact. At least, they were no petty thieves. I asked for my passport, but three hundred pounds refused. I wouldn't need it, he said. Can I get back my telephone? I asked. He waggled his index finger at me and made a sound like a passing train. Tish, tish, tish. But look, I need to tell my people. I'll be missed. He frowned. 
Who'll miss you? My girlfriend, I said quickly. I need to tell her that I'm okay. I call every day. He gave me a frightening, sharp look and dug my phone from one of his briefcases. I wanted to snatch it, but he stepped back. What name? He flipped inside my phone. His combination of natural force and cleverness was baffling. He was checking my call log. Vera, I said with a sigh. He shook his head. No call from or to Vera. Uh, I called from my hotel room. He laughed at me. You lie. I paid your bill. True. I hadn't called Vera for weeks. No wonder she didn't think much of me. I had nothing but gems and money and adventures on my mind. Nobody would miss me. Three hundred pounds stuck my phone back in his briefcase and handed me a simple but new black Nokia. Free telephone for you. Call me any time, he said. There was only one number in the contact list. Francis. I must have looked angry and he didn't like it. He pulled his trademark toothache grimace, grabbed me by the upper arm and pulled me closer. I hear everything. I see everything. You cheat and I'll have ants eat your balls. No calls without my permission. Understood? I nodded and wriggled under his grip. Seeing my distress, he laughed and gave me a spine-cracking slap. We're now working the same side, no? Yeah, right, you bloody mother. Before I could say anything stupid, there was a knock on the door and in came Richard's assistant. Warm pressure ran through my body. Finally, somebody pleasant. I suppose my eyes widened as she stepped up. Hand stretched out. Her grip was dry and tight and her palm felt like very fine sandpaper. Later I learned she played squash on the national team of Kenya. Lise, this is Edward, our new Richard, said three hundred pounds with a smirk. Do help him. Lizzie was twenty-five and usually worked on President Adriarani's staff. She wore proudly made-up Afro hair and was all milk and chocolate. She had an MBA, spoke English, French, Portuguese, and Swahili. Lizzie had been on the one-oar case from the beginning, for seven months now. In her high heels, she was taller than me. I'm usually afraid of tall women, but Lizzie seemed to be an exception. When did you see Richard last? I asked, after three hundred pounds left and we had finished the small chit-chat. Last Tuesday. The next morning he was gone. It was Tuesday again. One week. What happened? Apparently, he was kidnapped from his hotel room. Apparently? Yes, she looked away. I don't know the details. Francis keeps a tight ship. Wait, did you say from his room? Where? Here. This was his room. I called Francis. Could you not have put me in a different place? No, don't worry. You have a guard. Richard had no guard. I knew discussions were pointless. Any news about Richard? I asked. No. He hung up. Hiding in the bathroom, I filled the rough stones from the little creek into one of my usual seal bags, marked it with an H, and smuggled it under my other gemstones. Lizzie gave me Richard's passport. When I asked why I needed Richard's passport, she said, I have made you an appointment with the hotel's hairdresser. What for? Richard had red hair and no mustache. Do I have to pretend to be Richard? She waved her hand as if she wanted me to be quiet and said, Yes. Why? Never mind the details. But I do mind the details. Tell me, why can't we say Richard is sick or fell from the balcony or whatever and I take it from here? One or wouldn't care, would they? Lizzie deflected my question with a statement about corporate risk management and consistency in dealing with a foreign government. It was all true, but meaningless. One day, I thought, she'll make a great politician. If you really want to ask questions, try Francis, she said with a wry smile. But I warn you, he doesn't like questions. I studied Richard's passport. He was fifty-eight, ten years my senior. A smart-looking guy, like me, huh? Thin, six feet, short, reddish hair, 
Like me, he had visas and stamps from every place imaginable. Richard's business card read, Strategic Geological Consulting, London. There was a phone number on the card, but I doubted it would be a good idea to make contact. A picture of his wife with two kids was stapled in the passport. Has anybody informed his family? I asked. That's not our business. We need to let Francis handle that. I nodded. They wanted no publicity, not until the contract was signed. After the hairdresser, Lizzie worked me through the one or contract. It had laid out a legitimate, if complicated, development project. In the future, all mining permissions on Madagascar were going to be auctioned. No more small-scale mining by whoever was lucky enough to own the land. Instead, one ore would organize the public auctions. This was bad news for the Malagasy people. However, I was not surprised. It was the usual power grab by any government. But then I discovered a detail that, even by local standards, stank like ten dead cows during summer season. For two hundred million, one ore would get the right of first refusal for all licenses south of Morombe. Whenever one ore decided to buy a license, they paid only the minimum bid of the auction they themselves organized. They would effectively set their own buying price. Then they were free to resell the license to local miners and pocket the profit tax-free. With the contract signed, one ore would buy every license for chump change, empty the best mines themselves, and sell the leftovers back to locals. Put differently, President Adriarani was giving away the island's gems for a petty two hundred million, and the Malagasy people would have to pay one ore for the right to mine their own land. Who wrote this contract? I asked Lizzie. Martin, the project manager from one ore and his lawyers, and, well, Richard. It was briefed by the president himself. Was Richard happy with this contract? In what way? One ore gets all the licenses at minimum bid. That seems to be... I trailed off under her stern glare. I was not sure if I could trust her. Never mind. Forget it. I poured two Vicodin from the bottle and went for the minibar. Lizzie took the bottle and studied the label. Suddenly, with a quick movement of a squash player going for a drop shot, Lizzie stepped into the bathroom and, before I could limp behind her to hinder her, emptied my pills into the toilet and flushed. You better clean up she said and pointed a well-manicured finger at me. Tonight, we meet the president of Madagascar. I looked at the two pills in my hand, sighed, and dumped them in the garbage can. Chapter 3 2030, Tuesday, President Andriarani's Office, Antananarivo, Madagascar The President's office surprised me with an unassuming air. The place looked like the German Ministry of Public Health in the 70s. His reception room was small, nothing you'd expect, no stuffed lions or ivory tusks on the wall. Why was this man plundering his country? Was he? The plain secretary led us to a well-maintained but old sofa. Three hundred pounds sat on a chair at the wall. We declined tea. Mahifa Andriarani strode in with small, rapid steps, a pack of documents under his arm. He nodded at his secretary to close the door and sat down. He was a small man, thin, with the leathery skin of a fisherman and slick, comb-back gray hair. He had been legally voted President of Madagascar for two consecutive terms. He held a Ph.D. from Yale and had once chaired the African Union, an international statesman. Now he was the ruler of a country as big as France and a secret service that held my passport. 
Lizzie and 300 pounds snapped to attention. I was slow to react, but I didn't think he noticed. His dark eyes, crisp and sharp, first rested on Lizzie with a friendly nod, then flitted over to 300 pounds without a nod. Finally, they zoomed in on me. His piercing gaze drove sweat onto my forehead. I resolved to thank Lizzie for getting me off those Vicodins. It is tragic what happened to Richard, said Andriani. His mild voice exuded logic and reason. On the way from the Hilton, three hundred pounds had briefed me, intensely, that what happened in Talaria was anathema. I did not find a phone on the beach, nor did I escape from a secret police dungeon. Richard had been abducted, and I was his replacement. End of the official story. The president continued, I am grateful that you have accepted this awkward position. Rest assured it will not be to your disadvantage. Not my disadvantage? Like in getting paid? I thought and glimpsed sideways at Lizzie. No reaction. Has Francis elaborated on your remuneration? asked Adriani, and looked over to three hundred pounds, who, to my utter surprise, nodded and smiled amiably. He mentioned ants, I thought, as if Francis would elaborate on my remuneration. No, he didn't, I said curtly. Andriani ignored my answer, leaned back and asked, Are we meeting or one as planned? Neither Lizzie nor three hundred pounds made any attempt to join the conversation, so I said, Yes, we are. I wanted to shut up, but could not help adding, There is no problem with one or. The president frowned ever so slightly and asked, Any other problems? No, sir, but since I didn't follow the process from the beginning, allow me to remark that we might have negotiated more favorable terms. I tried to read the president's eyes, but there was no neural wave coming back from his brain. This man was trained not to reveal his thoughts. More favorable than two hundred million? he asked. I ran my fingers through my new red hair. No, I was rather thinking of the licenses. Lizzie blinked without taking her eyes off the president. Three hundred pounds shifted in his chair. Adriani signaled me to continue. I cleared my throat. Lizzie turned as if she was curious as to what I might have to say, though I was sure she knew. Perhaps we can set the calling price at market value, I said quickly, getting it out. The president looked at me in silence, nodding slowly. With a flick of his finger, he motioned the others to leave. Lizzie and three hundred pounds jumped up and vanished without a word. I was alone in the headmaster's office. Adriani got up, came around the desk, pulled up a chair, his one-way eyes fixed on me, and sat too close for comfort. He checked the room as if somebody might be listening in and lowered his voice. I shared your concern, really, I do. Perhaps I could have pressed for better terms, but I depend on one or's help. We need their money and their know-how to build the new mining industry with special police and judiciary and all. He leaned back. You know, the South is exploding in lawlessness. I nodded. Yes, I had been mugged twice. Crime, prostitution, and drugs had followed the sapphires. Asians, Africans, and Europeans battled over the anarchy. Gunfights were common. Civilians and their local government officials had fled the area. I agree, I said, but one ore is getting off too cheaply. Two hundred million cash up front is a lot of money, said Adriani. They need to make some profit. He didn't seem to be irritated with me, so I said, but there might be a hundred times more value in the land. Might be, yes, but... We will not see the benefit if it is dug out by crooks and smuggled abroad. The man was right. I felt like a frog having an opinion on dam construction. What did I know about running a government? My primary purpose is to ensure a stable government. We're losing control over the country. I can't collect taxes in the South 
I cannot impose order on ten thousand armed miners with my traffic police. The president sighed, got up, and returned to his chair. I need to get on top of this chaos. Never mind the profits. For months, everybody has been clamoring to assure his position, and this is how we have ended. I don't want to risk that balance. If one ore gets a good deal, so be it. But we need them on our side. Soon, the MLF will be better funded than us. You know about the MLF? Yes, I did. Lizzie had briefed me on the Malagasy Liberation Front, a semi-legal rebel group based in the South who were using the gemstones to fill their war chest for a revolution. Three hundred pounds had thought I was working for the MLF. Adria Rani gave me a binding look. Can I count on you? I nodded consent. The president stood up. Audience finished. When I came out, Lizzie jumped from the sofa with apprehensive inquisitiveness. I ignored her. It felt good for once to know more than Lizzie. Three hundred pounds was waiting in the car. He gave me a hard look, but said nothing. They dropped me at my room, and I ordered room service. For security reasons, Francis had advised me to stay in the hotel. If I needed anything, the hotel would provide it. I figured the bodyguard at my door was instructed to keep me in and others out. My feet hurt. I was dead tired, and life without painkillers was a drag. I slept badly. Wednesday. Hilton. The next day we finalized the schedule for Martin, our project manager from One Ore. It looked as follows. Thursday, 09.45. Pick up Martin Kolab from the airport. 1300. Lunch, Hilton. 1400 to 1700. Work session. 1900. Dinner at Capatos. 2300. Visit La Guarda. Open end. Friday. 1000 to 1200 work session 1300 lunch hilton 1400 visit cultural museum 1900 dinner hilton saturday 0930 pick up ceo from airport 1100 president adriarani arrives at hilton 1115 ratification of contract 1130 press conference with q and a 1300, lunch, Hilton, leisure time. 1730, one ore plane departs to New York. Martin Kolab, arriving two days before his CEO, was mainly interested in the after-hours activities. It was his idea to visit La Guarda, Tana's most notorious nightclub, and finish the day with open end. On the phone, he alluded to the exciting things he had heard about the nightlife in Madagascar. Lizzie rolled her beautiful eyes. What did the president say? asked Lizzie when we had finished working. Never mind the details. I copied her tone and wave of the hand from the day before. She burst out laughing. Lizzie did not laugh often, but when she did, it was hilarious. Her slender frame shook so wildly that one was afraid she might stumble on her high heels. At night, Lizzie took her always locked-in-hand Halliburton and went home. I had gathered that at home she had four stray cats but no family. She never made or received any private phone calls. As soon as she was gone, I felt lonely and decided to call St. Petersburg. The phone in my room was bugged for sure, but I was going to be strictly personal. Three hundred pounds would have no reason to complain if I called my girlfriend. Hey, Vera, darling, it's me. How are you? A snake-like hiss came through the receiver. You? You dare call me again? Dare you? I will morgally will call you, Padla. I was not sure what the last part meant, but it didn't sound welcoming. I ordered room service and slept as much as I could, which was not much. 0700, Thursday, Tana. In the morning, 300 pounds and Lizzie picked me up in a caravan of land cruisers. With blaring horns, we hammered through the sleepy city as if we had to save the world last minute. 
I don't know if we ran somebody over. We didn't stop. In the end, we were too early for the flight and waited in the deserted VIP room of Tana's airport. Martin arrived on a commercial flight from Paris. He was perhaps ten years younger than me, a small man with South European features. Though Lizzie towered a foot over him, Martin started to dig at her as if he was going to propose marriage soon. I disliked him instantly. Lizzie played along, and he was under her control within a minute. Three hundred pounds studied me from the side as we trotted behind the chattering duo. What? I asked. Nothing, he smiled. We road-raged back for lunch at the Hilton. Three hundred pounds had blocked the top floor, and he moved in with his men. We had a private meal room with twenty-four hour warm buffet, a conference hall, and four multilingual secretaries. Martin got the presidential suite next to me. Stealing two hundred million did not come cheap. Since the contract was ready, we spent the afternoon work sessions making small talk. Martin turned out to be a human porn projector. If Lizzie, the waitresses, or the secretaries were anywhere within sight, he had to gape at them, and his thoughts were embarrassingly obvious. 1930. Restaurant Capados, Tana. For the safari style restaurant overlooking the city, 300 pounds had arranged three dazzling entertainers. Martin immediately dropped Lizzie and picked Miss X Madagascar for his favorite. I left the booze untouched and didn't speak to the girls. I did not want Lizzie to associate me with dribbling Martin. 300 pounds drank only Coke on ice, but two of his men had orders to amuse themselves with Martin, murdering rows of cocktails. During dinner, Lizzie and I had a very pleasant conversation. She was born to the Kenyan housekeeper of the Argentinian ambassador in Nairobi, who was also her father. To the Argentinian's credit, the embassy had financed her education and she had put considerable energy into having more to offer than long legs. She was honest and open about her life story, but whenever I tried to speak about the one ordeal or the Richard situation, she diverted into foggy declarations. I told her of my life as a usually free gem junkie, and she seemed genuinely interested. She had followed the rise of the famous Savarites, a green gemstone rivaling emeralds, in Kenya. She shared my liberal views on mining in developing countries, and we promised each other to stay in touch after this weird assignment was finished. At midnight, 300 pounds handed out VIP passes for La Guarda. Martin was heavily intoxicated. The local rum cocktails were probably murderous. On the way to the cars, clinging to his new girlfriend, he swayed up to me and said, Now, this, he patted Miss X Madagascar, I call pleasant negotiations. I gave him a thumbs up and managed to get into a different car with Lizzie. Let's hope Francis has this guy under control said Lizzie, once the door was shut. I haven't been in a club for years, I said. My clubbing years had been intense, but short. Lizzie looked somewhat surprised and said, You'll be okay. O oh, thirty, Friday, LaGuarda, Tana. Outside the club, girls waited to be picked up and locals crowded to sell whatever was wanted. To get in, one had to be rich or white. Inside, it was teeming with the wildest coconuts, smash-drunk NGO execs, raving rich local brats, cross-dressing fashion models, and a selection of high-end hookers. Three hundred pounds and his men pushed into the VIP section like a fleet of icebreakers. There were six dance floors, three bars, a restaurant, and private suites where I don't know what was done behind one-way mirrors. Since the music was too loud for conversations, we sat smiling and watching Martin crossing cultural boundaries on the dance floor. I was tired and hoped that Martin would pass out soon, but then a miraculous surge of fresh energy hit the small man. One minute he was staggering, the next he jumped around like a firefighter. Miss X Madagascar must have spiked his drink with a night extender. 
one of those tasteless crystals that kept a man up all night. I groaned inwardly. Lizzie and I looked at each other. At least, I thought, there would be no visit to the cultural museum. Martin was going to feel a hundred and twenty years old tomorrow afternoon. Three hundred pounds pretended to be amused. He clapped his pancakes to the beat of happy techno. In the midst of the turmoil, Lizzie leaned over and yelled in my ear, Martin is getting a kickback. I stared, not sure I had understood correctly. Don't react, she yelled with a casual expression and added, Ten percent to Singapore. She clapped my knee with a smile and shouted, Funny, huh? I laughed as convincingly as possible. Ten percent? Twenty million? I looked at Martin zipping around the dance floor like an overcharged electric toy and felt the urge to rip the man's head off. Our VIP waiter passed by. I grabbed a cocktail from his tray and was planning to gulp it down, but then I noticed Lizzie's warning look and I took only a pro forma sip and set it on the table. I pointed at an especially unhinged dancer and yelled in Lizzie's ear, Does Adriani know? Lizzie wagged her head in a I-don't-think-so way. After a while, I asked, What happened to Richard? Lizzie laughed hysterically, gave me a double thumbs up and replied, I don't know. Somebody is against the deal. Three hundred pounds missed a beat with his pancakes. He was watching us even if he didn't look. Lizzie and I sat in silence, smiling and nodding to the music. I think three hundred pounds felt the sweat on my forehead before I did. I raised my cocktail and shouted at Lizzie, One will be enough. I don't drink. Lizzie nodded, understood. She was the type of woman one would want by his side. We returned at dawn. In the car, Lizzie chatted trivialities and avoided eye contact. She considered us under surveillance. The driver took her home. I dared not ask if she perhaps would like to stay on my sofa. In the Hilton, Martin and Miss X Madagascar careened straight to his room. I could not sleep. All kinds of disturbing noises came from the presidential suite. Totally inappropriate. Three hundred pounds should have put them elsewhere, but he probably had a camera running in Martin's room. I sat at the window and watched the sun stabbing into the smoky hills of Tana. Somebody is against this deal, Lizzie had said. Who? I was missing not only the pieces of the puzzle, but the entire overview. Martin got a kickback. Dirty, but not uncommon. Had Richard been kidnapped by whoever was against this deal? They must have guts to kidnap a man from a permanent suite of the secret police. Could the MLF pull off such a coup? They sure did not want to give up their mining. Yes, that made sense. The MLF must have abducted Richard to zap the deal. A trolley clinkered along the corridor and a knock came from my door. I opened to find a grim, fat African mama in a hotel uniform. I had forgotten to put up the Do Not Disturb sign. She stared at me, hesitated, and then said, May I clean your room? Yes, yes, come in. She pushed her trolley to block the door and hustled into my bathroom. I followed her close. She turned as I squeezed past her giant backside and gave me a stern warning look. I put a finger to my lips and turned on the faucet. She backed away. Just a question, I whispered, afraid she was going to make a commotion. She crossed her arms over her breasts and cocked her head. I hoped the trick with the running water worked as it did in spy movies. If not, three hundred pounds would be grilling me later. Last week, was there another Vazaha here? I asked in a low voice. With red hair, like me? She looked at my hair and nodded. Yes, yes, like you, but it is not you. I thought it is you, but it is not. What happened to him? She wavered. Probably she was not allowed to gossip about the guests. However, she could not resist the temptation and lean closer. I heard he did not pay his bill. That was to be expected, I thought. What happened? I don't know. She put on a contented face. 
It was not me he was unhappy with. He gave me a good tip. A very polite man. I stared. He gave you a tip before he left? Yes, a nice one. Left money under the dirty towels. Good guests make sure it is me who gets their tip. I make the room every day, and then the luggage boy or the minibar guy steals my money when people check out. But this Vizaha was the clever type. He left it under the towels for me to find. I thanked her, turned off the water, and went into the room. If you want me to get your money, then you need to put it where only I can find it, she called after me. I sat back on the window, more confused than ever. There had been no kidnapping. Three hundred pounds had dished me bullshit. Richard ran before the deal was closed. But why, or what from? Later, I found three hundred pounds lecturing some of his men in the conference room. I gathered my courage and asked him for a minute in private. When he dismissed his men, I asked, Can you tell me what demand was made from the telephone I found? Three hundred pounds face, by nature not merry, darkened. He shook his head. No. Did you tell Richard's family that he was kidnapped? No. He seemed to be suffering from a toothache again. You ask many questions. Why? Why? I was swept up by anger. Because I was taken from my hotel. Because I have no passport and you bully me and I have no idea what's going on. The contract will be signed tomorrow and then what? Will you chuck me into the sharks on the East Coast? No. Oh, good. We stared at each other for a moment. I'm not going to help you any more if I don't get some assurances, I said. Do what you must. I want my passport, and I want to leave the country when the deal is done. You are angry. Yes, I am. I am so angry I'm going to puke soon. Three hundred pounds seemed to remember our flight to Tana and stepped backwards. I followed behind, closing the gap again. It's time you do something for me, I said. I will not play along unless I get a guarantee of safety. Guarantee, huh? Yes, I want my passport, tickets, and I want compensation for my work here. Ah, he raised his eyebrows as if I had finally gotten to my point. How much? I lost business because of this whole affair, which was totally not my fault. I want 20K in cash, and I want out after Or One has signed. Okay. Okay? 20K and a business class flight to St. Petersburg. Any place. I have your word as an honorable man? Yes, totally. My anger deflated. Three hundred pounds lifted one pancake hand. But you must be silent. I knew any hesitation now might cost my life later. I looked him straight in the eye. Yes, I will forget all this. On a plane, I will suffer total amnesia. Poor countries get plundered. I felt bad, but three hundred pounds had me so deep inside his digestive system that I needed luck, not morals, to get out alive. Exits of digestive systems are dirty. If I was to get out, it wouldn't be clean. Late in the afternoon, a visibly aged Miss X Madagascar snuck out of the hotel. Martin appeared for dinner. His face looked as if it had been run over by a truck. I would have offered him some Vicodin but they were gone down the toilet. He muttered something about strong gravity and returned to his room without dinner. We chuckled when he was gone. Even three hundred pounds smiled. O oh, six hundred, Saturday. I had set my alarm for early morning and left the make my room sign hanging outside. As soon as I heard the rattling of the cleaning trolley, I opened my door went to the bathroom and turned on the water faucet. For ten dollars, I borrowed the maid's phone. This is Edward. Remember me? Hey, yes, yeah, he sounded sleepy. You need a reggae band? <laughs> no, you need a pen. Hold on. I heard kids screaming and waited until he was back, panting. I will tell you where I found those gems, I said. Oh, ja, cool. Promise to send me half of what you find. Yes, sure. 
swear on the honor of your mother. I do, yes, I promise by the honor of my mother. But you need to do this soon. After today, all gym prospecting will be illegal. What? Why? Don't ask. Write this down. Drive south from your village until you see a ragged hill line that looks like barracuda teeth. Then drive about two miles east to three boabab trees. 0930 Airport, Tana Peter Pastena, the legendary founder and CEO of the world's second largest mining company, arrived on his private jet. Martin had insisted on staying at the Hilton. Company policy, he explained. Their CEO did not want them to waste time on a pickup. I wondered what his CEO would say about the day with Miss X Madagascar. Luckily, it was not my business. I hoped to be in a different country within 24 hours. We drove right over the tarmac to the one oar plane. I know nothing about private jets, but it looked sleek and expensive with two engines and two doors. Protocol called on me to greet the man. Leisurely dressed in white linen, Peter Pastena came down the air stairs wearing dark shades, pressing against the sudden heat. In his late sixties and with 29% of a $135 billion company, he was beyond wearing dark suits. Our deal was probably not even an average ticket for him. Martin had remarked that he was going to announce something much bigger in New York the very next day. As he stepped onto the tarmac, Peter pushed the dark shades into his graying hair and revealed shining blue eyes. He smiled what looked like an honest smile and offered his hand. I introduced Lizzie and myself, meaning Richard. Three hundred pounds stayed behind, but he had brought extra security. In the distance patrolled an armored truck with machine gun. As we left the airport, I counted a dozen vehicles around us. I offered Peter a cold water from the van's minibar. I've been here in my early days, said Peter. One oar was not listed yet. Perhaps we had only a hundred people worldwide. That must have been 1970 or so. Did you have operations here? I asked. No, we were looking for heavy metal sands. Funny, I was not interested in precious gems in those days. We made some no-good tests and let it be never came back. I imagine Madagascar was very different in the seventies, Lizzie asked. Peter looked at the outskirts of Tana zipping past our darkened windows. No, I'm afraid not, he laughed, at least not on the surface. The gem deposits will be good for the country, I said. Yes, I sure hope so. That's why we're all here, right? I hesitated, glanced over to three hundred pounds, and only nodded politely. Peter took a sip from his water bottle. Has Martin done his job? I've been grooming the young man for some years. Lizzie and I exchanged a quick look. Oh, yes, sure, chirped Lizzie before I could say anything. Everything went fine. President Adriarani is coming? Eleven o'clock. All is planned, I said. Excellent. Excellent. Peter's eyes glazed over and he drifted off into some other issue on his agenda. 10.30, Hilton. Martin awaited us in the lobby. His face still looked squeezed, but he was fully functional. Peter seemed genuinely pleased as he hugged his project manager. Lizzie and I went up to the conference room. Three hundred pounds was whipping hotel staff into attention. His men had set up a checkpoint at the entrance to the conference room, opening bags and waving metal detectors. Twenty-nine minutes until your president arrives marked three hundred pounds at the quivering waiters. Inside the conference room, the walls had been covered by thick red curtains. Spotlights gave the room a festive, if somewhat bordello-like, atmosphere. All was ready. The presents, the champagne, and the two Meisterstück Mont Blanc pens engraved with dates and names. A dozen press teams had arrived, local journalists, but also some international names and faces. Three ladies from APA sat chatting, and Reuters had sent two dark suits. Left stood a boyish journalist from the Kenyan nation who greeted Lizzie happily. A blonde guy in aviator glasses and a New York Times shirt sat in the third row. 
A team in the back handled a big camera of TV Mata. All in all, the room was packed with forty-something people. The press section always works well, whispered Lizzie as we looked around the room. The PR spin is all that matters, I said wryly. Lizzie shot me a glance and leaned closer. You're not going to start any discussions, are you? Do I look suicidal? I shook my head. I want my passport? Then I'm out of here. Okay, said Lizzie, and I thought I saw regret in her face. At 10.45, Peter strolled in with Martin. Peter sat on the right chair, Martin behind him. Lizzie and I stood at the president's empty chair. Two thick leather binders, with one contract each, lay ready. Shortly before eleven, the president's bodyguards pushed in, making way for the little man in the dark suit and blue tie. Cameras flashed. Andrea Rani winked and smiled. The audience broke into spontaneous applause. The president and Peter shook hands. They sat down and opened the leather folders. To our left and right stood Adria Rani's bodyguards, two men on each side. Three hundred pounds towered behind the audience. The president took out a pair of reading glasses. Both men pretended to study the contract for the benefit of the press, but soon skipped to where Lizzie had inserted the white post-its for the signatures. In unison, the men picked up the Mont Blanc pens. I glanced sideways at Martin. He was intently watching Peter's fingers loosening for a $200 million signature. And his kickback, I thought, with some bitterness. Just as Peter's pen touched the paper, a shout went through the room. The blonde New York Times journalist jumped up and threw his aviator glasses at Peter. Peter leaned back in surprise, pen in hand. The journalist pulled his wig off, revealing red hair, and threw the wig at the president. Richard! Lizzie hissed. Thieves! cried the man, unrolled a banner and waved it at the audience. I couldn't read the text. Martin raised one hand to his mouth, like a princess. From the back, three hundred pounds roared orders in Malagasy. Several men bounced to the tightly packed audience. Richard evaded the oncoming security avalanche, all the while shouting and waving his banner. The big TV cam returned, but three hundred pounds gave it a violent shove. It tipped over, taking down two men and upsetting tables. Richard turned and I could read the banner. It said, No to corruption. The president rose from his seat and shouted, demanding order. Peter looked from one to another with a distant smirk. This was probably more amusing than his usual signature ceremonies. A separate fight broke out between two journalists. Richard was very nimble for a man of his age, not to speak of courageousness. Three hundred pounds cursed and, with his most frightening toothache grimace, personally went after Richard. He shoved people aside like plastic dolls. Papers rose in the air. A chair flew by. Porcelain crashed. Everybody yelled. Handheld cameras panned left and right. Flashlights zapped in the room. The room looked as if somebody was sinking a blender into it, but that was only the beginning. My eyes caught on the bodyguard next to Lizzie a squarish fellow with a toad-like face. I hadn't noticed him before. All other bodyguards had moved around the table to join the fight, except this man. He stood, hunched forward, staring at his own feet as if he was waiting for something. His body seemed to oscillate. Lizzie followed my surprised glance. The toad man looked up. No good. In a fluid motion, he pulled a big black gun from his jacket. He can't fire into the crowd, I thought, petrified, unable to move. The toad man yelled, Murdier Shia, and pointed the gun at Adriarani. For a second time, I witnessed the speed that made Lizzie a good squash player. She rammed sideways and into the man's arm. The shot crashed through the room. Adriarani screamed, clutching his head. The Mont Blanc pen sailed through the air. Blood, not ink, splattered across the contract. Peter threw himself backwards, his heavy chair pinned Martin against the wall. The toad man struggled to fire a second shot at the president, but Lizzie hung on his arm like a Rottweiler. I punched the man in the face with little effect. The second bullet tore into the table. Then three hundred pounds came down on the toad man like an ox thrown from an airplane. Lizzie and I fell, 
Bodyguards tackled Adriarani. Emergency lights flooded the room. Three hundred pounds bludgeoned the toad man lying on the floor. We crawled around like a scared litter of puppies in a box. For an instant, my face was pressed into Lizzie's belly. I noted the sweet musky scent and soft tightness of her muscles, as if I had no other worries. Finally, three hundred pounds stopped beating the man and came up, his eyes rolling, and the man's gun in his fist. Lizzie and I helped each other to our feet. Peter crawled over to Martin, who rolled on the floor, groaning and holding his foot. Adria Rani leaned against the red curtain, his hand pressed against his left ear. Blood gushed through his fingers. He stared at Richard, his eyes angry and very alive. Richard stood motionless amidst the debris, his banner now hanging limp from his hand. He looked at the toad man and shook his head in bewilderment. Two security men rushed at him. He did not try to flee, but turned to Adriarani and yelled, I didn't know! I didn't know! They threw him on the ground and rammed their knees into his back. The bloody contracts lay on the table, unsigned. Medics came running with stretchers. Adriarani refused to lie down and walked out of the room while a frantic nurse tried to stop the bleeding from his ear. The toad man was lifted onto a stretcher. He did not move. I turned away so as not to see his face. We stumbled out into the corridor but could not get further. Three hundred pounds men blocked the elevators and staircases. People milled around aimless, shouting into their phones. Some were crying. Everybody was shell-shocked. Three men dragged Richard through the corridor. Now he was fighting and screaming, his face bloody. When he passed us, he looked at Lizzie and whispered, Help me! Lizzie stood. If she nodded, it was not perceptible. I didn't know, he yelled one last time before they threw him in the elevator. I shuddered at the thought of what was going to happen to him. I don't want to be in his place, I said without much thought. Lizzie gave me an unpleasant look. You are still holding his passport. Before I could tell her I was not holding anything, Peter stepped up and asked, Who was that guy? Richard, answered Lizzie. Peter frowned, confused, and looked at me. So, who are you? Edward Bristol. Richard disappeared last week. I was pressed into this, somehow. Before Peter could ask any questions, Martin came out on a stretcher. His foot was twisted in a strange angle. Peter rushed behind, holding Martin's hand, but security stopped him from entering the elevator. Peter glared at the man. Let me through. I want to go with him. Three hundred pounds' voice boomed through the corridor. Nobody leaves the hotel. Moans of cries and protest ensued from the crowd. Peter pushed through, but three hundred pounds did not budge. He raised his hand. Nobody! More politely, he addressed Peter. Please, go to Richard's room. We will talk there. We did what we were told. Peter shut himself in my bathroom. I heard him yelling on his phone. I kept thinking of Peter's private jet on the tarmac and of my passport. All bets were so off. Soon after, three hundred pounds rushed in with two men. He was in a terrible hurry and did not sit down. We called Peter from the bathroom. I have to be in New York tomorrow, he said. Sorry, you have to cancel that. Peter's cheeks were blotchy red. You have no right, he began. Three hundred pounds interrupted him. Our president has been shot. I have the right to keep everybody involved under arrest for seventy-two hours until all testimonials have been taken. You can ask your lawyer. From Peter's face, I guessed that he already had asked his lawyer. Fine. Take my testimonial then, he said. Three hundred pounds wagged his finger at Peter. Not so fast. We still want to sign the contract, right? But the president? He is fine, said three hundred pounds. We will sign the contract tomorrow. Then you can go. Peter drew a deep breath, but three hundred pounds was faster. Let's stay friends, yes? Peter changed from blotchy red to purplish, opening his mouth and closing it again. I thought he was going to have a fit, but three hundred pounds simply left us standing. Welcome to Madagascar, 
I said. Lizzie shot me a warning look. Peter returned into the bathroom, slamming the door. Lizzie and I watched cable TV. Our local mining contract had made it straight to international news. If Richard wanted attention, the trick sure had worked, probably more so than he wished. A live feed from the press conference had gone out, showing shaky images of the wild chase and his shouts of, Thieves! Thieves! For a moment, his banner, No to Corruption, was clearly legible. When the first shot thundered, the camera swung around and captured Lizzie hanging on to the toad man's arm while I punched him. In the front, Adria Rani was gushing blood as his bodyguards pulled him off camera. The second shot boomed, its muzzle fire clearly visible, and three hundred pounds tore into the picture. For the press, it was a million-dollar scene. The news anchor declared that the assassination had been intended as the starting point for a pooch by the Malagasy Liberation Front, but, with the president alive, the government had turned the table. All over the island, MLF quarters were raided and, everybody assumed, its leadership executed. Adria Rani was safe at a hospital and would give a speech later in the day, CNN said. Soon, reporters began to ask questions. Who was the guy helping to get a shot at the president? What was he yelling about? Why was the CEO of one or there? Peter groaned under the publicity. During a commercial selling skin whitener, he asked Lizzie, Are you sure Richard was not a part of this? Yes, I'm sure, Lizzie watched the lady with the white skin. How do you know? Peter asked. Lizzie frowned. I worked with the man for months. He was not the assassin type. He does seem radical with his banner, no? I remarked. The skin whitener ad ended. Yeah, he was an idealist, Lizzie turned with a sigh. But shooting Adria Rani, an elected president? No way. The CNN reporter came back on screen asking more questions. Peter took the remote and muted the TV. Tell me what happened here. Lizzie grunted, laid a finger on thoughtfully pursed lips, looked at me, then back at Peter, got up and said with a stern face, Come with me. Lizzie picked up her Halliburton and walked out. Peter and I hurried to follow her down the corridor. She led us through a staff-only door, then got a key card from her pocket and opened an unmarked door. In size, the room was like other guest rooms, but it contained only one giant bed, a small stool, and a shelf. The ceiling and two walls were covered by mirrors. What is this place? Peter asked. It's the manager's private room, Lizzie sat on the big bed and crossed her legs. He's in Europe this week. I stepped up to the shelf. There were packages of paper tissues in a black box with a golden Pleasure XXL imprinted on the lid. Behind it lay a half-empty tube of KY. How practical. The manager's private room. As boss of the only international hotel in Tana, one probably had many opportunities to negotiate with the staff and suppliers. I had seen the manager hustling around with his entourage, a good-looking fellow. Please, wait in my private room. We sure will work something out. Suddenly, jealousy flooded my system. Stunned, I turned and asked, How do you know? Lizzie looked at me with a defiant expression. Well, I just know. Leave it at that. I concentrated on behaving unaffected, but I must have blushed into an awkward silence. So, this room is not bugged? asked Peter. Lizzie nodded. It's also soundproof. I so hated the details. Then let me hear, Peter said. What happened to Richard? Lizzie collected herself for a moment and said, He lost patience, got desperate. The MLF must have contacted him and offered a publicity stunt. He took the bait and ran off. But why? asked Peter. Lizzie did not answer, but looked at me, sighed and wearily shook her head. I turned to Lizzie. You lose your job. Am I missing something here? asked Peter. Lizzie shrugged. And Francis? I asked her. Lizzie scowled. Damn him! After what happened today, he can be happy to survive. Adria Rani will not be pleased. 
It was me who saved the president's life, not Francis. I have credit. I made a peace sign and backed off. Lizzie swung her Halliburton onto the bed and entered the code. The lock cracked dryly. For the first time, Lizzie opened the case. It was loaded with papers. Then she turned to Peter. Will you keep this confidential? Sure. Lizzie motioned him to sit down on the little stool. I leaned against the wall. Lizzie straightened. How much do you know about your business here? She asked Peter. I know the main parameters. Two hundred million cash for the concession in the South, tax-free for ten years. Doesn't seem wrong. This deal is so wrong that I've been getting bad skin, Lizzie scoffed. Peter frowned. If you want to tell me that we shan't make any profits, I will not listen. He shook his head. No third world speeches, please. I've heard it too many. One needs incentives to invest in a high fucking risk country. For 5% return, I'll buy U.S. government bonds. Shit like this? He waved his hand at everything. Needs extra margins. Lizzie glared at him. Perhaps you are part of the reason it is high risk in the first place. Ah, always the same nonsense, Peter moaned. Did I fund the liberation whatever front? No, I didn't, he punched his chest. I bring the money and work. Your money is wasted and the work used to be called slavery. You're being dramatic, Peter said wearily. I can't change a country and its system. We are here. We do our part. Do you then? Lizzie's face darkened. Yes. Look at this mess, cried Peter and jumped up. I'm kept hostage by this gorilla. I missed my presentation in New York. I risked my life. We're all over the press. Our project manager is in the hospital. He stepped to the door. I'll not continue this discussion. Lizzie said in a low but biting tone, Your project manager took a worthwhile risk. How do you mean? Peter looked back, one hand on the doorknob. Ten percent to his account in Singapore. Peter turned slowly, his chin dropping. Lizzie fished a paper from her briefcase and threw it on the bed. I glanced at the paper. It was a letter from the Far Eastern Bank in Singapore. Peter swayed over, took up the paper, returned to his little stool, sat down, studied the document for a moment, and then said, You have my attention. Lizzie spoke in rapid fire, inviting neither interruptions nor questions. Let me summarize for you. Twenty million goes to Martin. One hundred and twenty million to build a new ministry, where those wankers can make themselves important until they go home to their luxurious condos, also paid by you. There is no budget for environmental issues, none for education or health care in the South. Only for new cars and housing here in Tana. Nothing goes to the people who need it or deserve it. Lizzie pulled document after document from her case and threw them on the bed like mortar fire. Sixty million is slotted for the new mining police, staffed with four hundred officers. Guess who's running it? she asked with a sideways glance at me. Francis, the gorilla. He'll be the top enforcer. Poor people. Lizzie laughed. Oh, I forgot. The new mining ministry? She pretended to look up a detail in her papers. Ah, it'll have an underground infinity pool. That's just what this country needs most. Peter's face was defiant. I can't decide what a government does with its money. I agree that the development factor could be better, but it's not for us. I'm not finished, Lizzie interrupted. We will waste your two hundred million, okay? That's not your fault. But then you get your part of the deal and it gets worse. The best mines will be depleted by one ore. The lesser ones you'll auction off for profit, tax-free. Peter pinched his nose. Lizzie continued. The mines will only go to the people who pay. The locals actually owning the land get kicked from their homes. There's no budget for compensation. If they complain, Francis will enforce your interest. You call that knowledge transfer? I'm sure we will learn the lesson. Lizzie looked at me, pale and spent. Did I forget anything? No, I said. This pretty much sums it up. I wanted to give her a big hug, but dared not. Peter sat in silence for a long while, staring at himself in the mirror. And I am not being dramatic. 
Lizzie pointed at the papers covering the bed. These are all facts. Peter looked over at the documents with dead, tired eyes. The shiny gleam that I had seen on the tarmac was gone. I pitied him. He probably signed dozens of documents every day of the week. I assume you did not read the contract, I asked. No, of course not, said Peter. But it seems I should have. I just didn't think we'd do harm here, with Martin leading the project and all. His face grew bitter. Since it's confession time, here is one more. I groomed Martin for one reason. He's engaged my daughter. I was going to retire next year and let Martin take over one or later. I was going to make the announcement tomorrow in New York. Lizzie nodded, unsurprised. Richard, the industry insider, must have known or guessed. Hindering Martin's promotion made even more sense. Stupid fool, Peter slammed his thighs. This is not happening. I'll break his foot one more time. Peter stood up. Uh, I'm afraid I have a long night ahead. Are you two free? Ten hundred Sunday, Adria Rani's office. The presidential ear was heavily bandaged. The lopsided, padded head over his small body seemed absurdly dominant. Lizzie carried the contracts. The blood hadn't washed off yesterday's leather folders, so he had used unceremonial paper clips. A nurse pushed in Martin sitting in a wheelchair. His left foot was plastered, his face drawn and gray. Peter gave him a professional handshake and asked how he was doing, but didn't listen to the answer. Three hundred pounds looked tired, too. I guessed he had, like us, not slept since the shooting. Around the conference table sat Adriarani, his secretary, Peter, myself, Lizzie, Martin, and three hundred pounds. The president waited for everybody to settle and then turned to Lizzie. First, I need to thank you with, well, it seems I have to thank you with my life. He wanted to touch his bandaged head, but stopped mid-movement, forcing his hands to fold on the table in front of him. Lizzie smiled humbly. I only did my duty. Yes, the president said, more so than others. I glanced at three hundred pounds. He was suffering some severe toothaches, his head pulled between his shoulders like a turtle. The president picked up the contract and looked at Peter. I hear you are needed in New York? No, not any more, said Peter curtly. Martin flinched in his wheelchair. The president raised his eyebrows. Peter pulled a digital recorder from his pocket. President Andrea Rani, may I ask your permission to record this conversation? Andrea Rani leaned back in surprise. That would be very unusual. I believe we have an unusual situation, Peter replied. The president considered this. Three hundred pounds raised his hand in protest, but Adria Rani made a face that did not invite discussions. Unusual situation. Hmm, indeed, yes, that can be said. Go ahead. I have nothing to hide. Peter pressed a button on the recorder and looked around the table. The air crackled. We've made changes to the contract, Mr. President. You have? Adria Rani glanced at Lizzie. Yes. Yesterday's event has raised some questions. I also have had time to read the contract. Three hundred pounds looked at Martin, who closed his eyes. Adria Rani stared at the paperwork. You are aware that changes need to go through our legal department. With all due respect, Mr. President, said Peter, I think you have the authority to accept the changes right here and now. Adria Rani looked from one to another, then back to Peter. Or else? I will fly to New York and I will have to announce that all our business in the Republic of Madagascar is cancelled due to political instability. Martin leaned in, his wheelchair squawking. But Peter! Peter stopped him with a derisive wave of his hand. All business cancelled due to political instability and corruption. Martin bit his tongue. Adria Rani's skin color dropped to a lighter shade. His hand touched the bandage, and he groaned. Furthermore, said Peter, I want Mr. Richard to be president before we sign. It's my opinion that he deserves to be here. 
three hundred pounds, jumped up, his outburst shaking the table. Sir, Richard is a traitor, a terrorist. We cannot negotiate with a national security risk at the table. He is MLF. He is not, said Lizzie. Three hundred pounds glared at her. His pancakes twitched in a strangling motion. Adriani flicked his finger at three hundred pounds, who forced his body back down on the chair. Peter leaned in. Furthermore, I need your guarantee of safe conduct for everybody at this table, Mr. President. I will take those willing with me on my plane. The President leaned back with an indignant scowl. I represent a lawful government, not some jungle rebels. Mr. President, I am aware of that. However, I must tell you that members of this project team have been threatened by your secret police. Adriani fixed an icy stare on three hundred pounds. Francis, have you or your men threatened anybody in this room? Three hundred pounds shook his head until I raised my hand. Three hundred pounds opened his mouth, face reddening, eyes burning. The president nodded at me. I dared not look at three hundred pounds, but his stare made my breathing difficult. With Martin's wheelchair in between, I was at least out of the immediate reach of his pancakes. I was forced into service, Mr. President. I said, "My passport has been taken, and yes, I was threatened with torture and death." Three hundred pounds jumped up again. He was in possession of Richard's mobile phone. I could have shot him on sight. We thought he was MLF, but he wasn't, right? Asked Adria Rani, impatiently motioning three hundred pounds to sit down. We did not know," said three hundred pounds, faltering back into his chair. "You did not know. Am I then right to conclude that you allowed a potential MLF agent to visit my office?" Asked Adria Rani. No, then、uh, not any more. He agreed to help us. I agreed. An angry shudder ran through my spine, and I looked straight at three hundred pounds. You said you will feed me to the ants if I don't. Adria Rani glared at three hundred pounds. Is this true? Three hundred pounds squirmed in his chair. Sir, he tried to blackmail us. He wanted money. Blackmail you? When? I blurted, when I was bound naked and you wanted to mash my face. Three hundred pounds looked like he was going to fulfill his threat right there and then. I hoped Lizzie's evaluation of the president's power and three hundred pounds' downfall was accurate. It was. Is Mister Richard alive? Adriani asked. The chief of secret police hesitated. Yes. Ah,、uh, I should think so. Bring him here, Francis. Said Adriani, three hundred pounds wanted to protest, but thought better of it and pulled out his mobile phone. Adriani lifted his finger again. No, Francis. Personally, I want you to go and get him. Three hundred pounds stared at his chief commander for one moment too long. This is an order, barked Adriani, and immediately moaned in pain, holding his head. Three hundred pounds jumped up and made for the door. And Francis, three hundred pounds stopped and turned. You are responsible for the man. No funny stories of accidents. Bring him here alive. When the door had closed, Adriani sighed. Things get complicated. This is why I must insist on your guarantee of safety," said Peter. Adriani nodded slowly. I will personally escort you to the airport after we are finished here. He collected himself and looked around the table. Well then, what changes have you made? Lizzie handed Adriani the spreadsheets we have been working on all night. I hear you need a mining ministry and a mining police. Asked Peter. The president glanced at me and nodded. You shall get it. I propose to budget 125 million for the setup and 5 million annually for five years. We want to hire a political outsider as mining minister. He will decide who runs the mining police. There will be no indoor pool, but lapidary and goldsmith schools in the south. Adriani made a sound between a chuckle and a cough. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. He turned to the next page.
We will organize the auctions in the South, with a right of first refusal as planned, but there will be a share of compensation funds for those who now live on the land. The fund will be fed by a 50% share of our resale profits, plus $30 million from us in cash. Thus, in total, we come up with $180 million. Peter jabbed a sudden finger at Martin. That is $20 million less than planned. He turned back to Adriani. But it will not affect your government's budget. Martin, pale as yogurt, hid his face behind his hands and began to sob. The president slowly looked from one to another, nodded, and returned to the papers. Later, Richard staggered in with 300 pounds. He still wore the New York Times t-shirt. 300 pounds dropped him on a chair and was about to sit down himself, but Adriani lifted his finger. Thank you, Francis. Now, please, go and get the passports of these two gents and their promised retainers. They'll be leaving on Peter's plane in an hour. See that all is ready. The chief of secret police froze with his back bent and his bottom hovering over the chair. He straightened himself and looked around the table. His face quivered with intense toothache. Then, suddenly, the tooth came out. An unprecedented expression of relief came over his face. He snapped to attention. Yes, sir, and walked out. I heard he resigned from his post for personal reasons. 1800 Sunday, Tana to New York, via Nairobi. The sun sank into the African continent as Peter's jet crossed the coast of Madagascar. I pointed at the white beaches and turquoise water below. Lizzie leaned over me to look through the window. Her perfume gave me a warm shudder. Oh, like paradise, she said. Yeah, at least from up here. We smiled. Did I tell you that I have an uncle mining the Savarite fields? No, you didn't, I said. Would you like to come and visit his mines? I sure would love to. Be my guest. We could stay at my family's place for a few days and then rent a car. We looked at each other. Her brown eyes shone. My heart pumped louder than the jet engines. That sounds like the best plan I've had in years, I said. It really did. In the back of the airplane, Peter was washing Martin's head with Marseille soup and cold water. Martin muttered pained excuses, groaned and squirmed in his wheelchair. Earlier, Lizzie and I had agreed to omit Miss X Madagascar. However, Martin would not make it to the altar, at least not with Peter's daughter. I don't know what happened to him. When Lizzie went to the restroom, Richard slid on the seat next to me. How did you get into this? I found a phone on the beach. When I answered it, I had a fat fellow on the line. Wow, Richard stared thoughtfully and nodded. Yes, the MLF suggested bringing the project phone on the coast and calling Francis from there. It was a government phone, you know. Yeah, I figured, later. We were sure it was bugged and that Francis would follow the call. Oh, he did. Spot on. Richard laughed. Oh, man. I am so sorry. Ah, well, it seems to have been good for something in the end, I said, as I watched Lizzie coming down the aisle. Trouble in Madagascar by Edward Bristol. Copyright 2013, Edward Bristol.